Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And uh, a warm welcome to all the viewers to the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation's webinar on Iran's nuclear program and decision making. Two words about our center. We are an international NGO located in um, have a uh, manifold mission, part of which is to serve as a platform for exchange of views, for connecting experts in the field to diplomatic community and to international organizations. So as part of, of that work, we host a lot of uh, seminars or webinars as the current reality dictates uh, discussions and, and workshops. Another part of our mission is training and education and uh, in that vein, we uh, organize periodic training courses for diplomats on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. And right now we are in day two of one of our courses. Uh, and, and so I'm really pleased that we are able, uh, once again, to integrate a public event into our uh, training course that uh, this time for the first time is taking place entirely online. Um, with that, I am going to switch to the actual topic. So if you follow nuclear weapons issues, or if you don't try to follow nuclear weapons issues, you cannot possibly avoid the issue of Iran's nuclear program. It indeed has occupied a high place in the, on the international agenda for about two decades now. And uh, concerns about the intentions behind Iran's nuclear program persist despite the country insisting uh, once time and again, that the intentions are entirely peaceful. And throughout this, uh, uh, the last two decades, there have been many attempts to arrive at a negotiated diplomatic solution to the question of um, Iran's nuclear program and, and motivations. And the most recent attempt was, of course, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action agreed in 2015 and currently uh, staying on a bit of a life support. But while the negotiations outcomes or failures, as it were, occupy headlines and are hard to avoid. The actual motivations of any given country, um, the processes by which the country arrives to decisions on whether to pursue a nuclear program, how to pursue a nuclear program, whether to engage in negotiations, where to give and take, those, um, those remain a bit behind the veil and in Iran's case in particular. Uh, for, for a long time, especially for Western observers, uh, Iran's decision-making and internal politics remained, remained a mystery, and often that resulted in misunderstanding of motivations, misunderstanding of certain decisions. Um, and in, that, um, in addressing that, I am really, really pleased to host this webinar and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ariane Tabatabai, who is uh, currently a Middle East Fellow at the Alliance for securing democracy at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and an adjunct senior research scholar at the Columbia University. Prior to this, these current positions, she um, served as an associate political scientist at the Rand Corporation and was, uh, was director of curriculum and visiting assistant professor at um, Georgetown University Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Ariane is uh, one of the world's leading experts on Iran's uh, security policy and nuclear program in particular. She's a, a frequent commentator on, on current uh, developments in Iran and is an exceptionally prolific author. I've given up on keeping, keeping up with your publications, Iran, uh, Ariane, but I would just highlight the, the latest book that, uh, that was released just several days ago, I believe. Uh, no Conquest, No Defeat, um, Iran's Security Policy. Do check it out. Uh, she's also a co-author of Triple Access with Dina Esfandiari. Uh, and a, uh, she, co she wrote the recent report published by Columbia University on Iran's nuclear decision-making implications for US policy, which is the decision-making in Iran is the, the focus of today's webinar. Um, before I pass the floor to Ariane, I would just uh, uh, note that if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you are following us, uh, us on YouTube and cannot use Zoom, then please submit your questions to events at 
vctnp.org. And I will address them uh, after, after our speaker's remarks. With that, Ariane, thank you so very much for joining us and taking the time. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Gohar, for having me for your very kind introduction and uh, to VCDNP for having me again. It's always a pleasure, even though uh, it's all remote uh, and um, I would have loved to be in Vienna with you all. Uh, so as Gohar mentioned, uh, I'm going to be touching on Iran's uh, nuclear decision making today. Uh, I am sure there will be plenty of questions about all other aspects of Iran's nuclear policies, and I'm happy to get to those. Uh, I know it's a, it's a topical, uh, it's always a topical issue. It's especially topical now as uh, here in the United States, we are looking at the final uh, weeks before our presidential elections. And um, you know, one of the top foreign policy items on the next president's agenda, whether it's President Trump uh, or uh, uh, Vice President Biden um, uh, being inaugurated uh, is definitely going to be how to deal with Iran's nuclear program um, and uh, what to do next when it comes to uh, the challenges that the United, see, the United States uh, sees presented by Iran's foreign policy more generally. So um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about why I was interested in this uh, topic. I think Gohar did a really good job of sort of laying out some of the unknowns here. Uh, but what I've been interested in uh, for a number of years now, starting with the nuclear talks in the 2012 to 2015 timeframe that ultimately led to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015, uh, to the U.S. withdrawal in 2018 from that same deal and Iran's decision in, uh, a year later in 2019 to resume aspects of its nuclear program previously limited by, uh, by the agreements. Um, the, the question of how Iran was making those decisions was one that was interesting to me and that I thought was not really getting as much uh, attention uh, as some of the uh, actual policies uh, that were taking place. And that's for a few reasons. One is that you know, this is, I mean, the Iranian political system is often assumed to be uh, very complex, and it is. There are a number of different power centers. There are redundant power centers uh, that exist uh, that are sort of designed to coup proof one another, that are designed to check one another. Um, we don't always have a lot of really good information about uh, what happens inside uh, some of these uh, bodies. Uh, you know, we kind of see statements here and there, which we have to take with a grain of salt as any really official statements, uh, but it's really uh, unclear what sort of internal bargaining actually happens. And to top all of this, you have a supreme leader who uh, is the most uh, sort of visible uh, part of the Iranian government and is frequently assumed that, you know, he makes all the decisions um, and that's about it. I mean, the sort of shorthand for how decision making in Iran happens is, uh, you know, the supreme leader um, is the final authority, the, the highest authority and has the final say on all issues uh, foreign and domestic. So um, all of these mean that you don't really have a ton of clarity about how it is that Iran makes decisions pertaining to its nuclear program, whether it's the nature of the nuclear program itself, whether Iran should be pursuing uh, a nuclear weapon, for example, as it has debated over the course of uh, several decades, actually going back to the pre-revolution time, uh, whether it should be uh, negotiating about the future of its nuclear program and making concessions uh, in exchange for sanctions relief as has been topical uh, at least several times over the past two decades. Uh, it's not very clear how this decision making process takes place. And once you know there is a decision that is made on, on how to negotiate, uh, we again often don't have a lot of clarity about uh, how the decision to sort of draw the contours of a potential agreement are made. And so all these reasons push me to sort of look into this um, uh, a bit more and try to uh, come up with a framework for understanding how Iran uh, makes its decisions when it comes to its nuclear program. Program. Uh, but I want to start with also a couple of caveats, and this is the academic in me, that, um, you know, what I'm about to tell you is not perfect, right? That um, we actually, at the end of the day, there's still a lot of unknowns. We are, after all, talking about one of the most sensitive programs that the country has. Uh, and um, we are still dealing with a country that has a number of competing power centers and uh, is not very clear in its, um, it's not always very transparent, it's not very uh, accountable, and that makes it difficult to know exactly what happens in there. Uh, 
Uh, and we have, you know, there is scholarship, there is now the nuclear archive that was uh, retrieved by Israel that has, you know, that uh, researchers have had, some researchers have had access to. Uh, in my case, I did a number of interviews over the course of the past decade with Iranian decision makers, policy makers, uh, but none of this information is um, something that you can take completely for granted. Uh, you always have to take it with a grain of salt and it's imperfect. So there are still critical blind spots uh, in uh, the report that I, I put out, uh, I am sure, and uh, in what I'm going to, to explain here. Uh, and so I'm hoping that this will be sort of the first stab at, a, at an important topic uh, rather than the, the only and most comp comprehensive uh, effort um, uh, like this. So with this, let me actually start talking about the substance of, of the, the decision making. Uh, so again, as I was mentioning, you have this sort of tendency, I think, this assumption often in uh, certainly in the United States and, and in Europe as well, that um, the Supreme Leader makes all the decisions when it comes to Iran's nuclear program, also more generally on many most items uh, of foreign policy. Um, and so that, you know, we don't need to necessarily be digging too much into the decision making process. On the flip side, you have another school of thought that tends to kind of capture uh, how I think a lot of people think about Iran and its system, which is that, you know, it's too messy to understand anyway, that you have all these competing power centers uh, and factions and blocks, all of which are kind of engaged in this, um, in this bargaining game and uh, which are trying to undermine each other. So often when Iran does something um, in the military realm, for example, you'll see a lot of examples of that um, over the course of 2019 when US-Iran tensions were, were escalating in, in the Persian Gulf and in Iraq, uh, that uh, people will, will talk about how, you know, oh, well, this might be the IRGC or the hardliners trying to undercut the, the moderates. Um, and I think that's also not a very good way of sort of capturing what actually happens in the Iranian political system. Uh, it is a messy uh, system, but it is a system after all. And at the end of the day, uh, the first and foremost sort of point I want you to take away from this is that when it comes to strategic level decision making, um, Iran does act as a unitary state. Um, and so Iran puts out policies and decisions that it is going to enact as a state. That doesn't mean that there are no politics. The politics happen prior to that strategy or that, or that policy being formulated entirely. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that happens within the system. So um, in the context of uh, the nuclear program, this is also broadly true of Iran's national security decisions uh, in, in general. Uh, the Supreme Leader, of course, sits at the top of the sort of structure of many power centers, uh, and he determines the framework often within which uh, decisions are made, within which organizations within the system can operate, and uh, within which these decisions are ultimately made and, and uh, policies are formulated. Uh, and the way the Supreme Leader tends to could have created this framework is through the communication of bottom lines and red lines and what are acceptable outcomes for the system. In other words, he may not necessarily be sort of determining the, um, the tactical and specifics of each uh, issue that he's touching. For example, I don't think the Supreme Leader is necessarily sitting there thinking about how many centrifuges should be running at X facility uh, at the beginning of negotiations. Uh, but but in the as we saw in the 2012 to 2015 timeframe, for example, he certainly was uh, creating red lines pertaining to the fact that Iran could not close any of its nuclear facilities, even if it meant that some of them like Fordo ended up being repurposed, they still had to be kept open. Um, or that, you know, enrichment uh, as uh, just in general, Iran should per should continue to pursue uh, enrichment, even though there were no specifics put out for a while about the contours of the enrichment program, how many centrifuges, what capacity, etc. So uh, once the Supreme Leader has made this sort of, um, has created this framework, and this, a lot of it happens um, in, in private, some of it happens in, in public. Uh, we see examples of it in the context of, say, Friday prayers, where normally there is the sort of sermon uh, part of it um, and uh, the, uh, the, the remarks part of it, where the Supreme Leader will engage in sort of political discussions. And 
when he does that, he is essentially uh, making public perhaps some of the things that he's communicating in, in private as well and stating that, you know, Iran should do X, Y, and Z. And now it's sort of uh, this framework is made public and raises the cost for the system to do to go against that framework. Once that framework has been created, uh, it is normally passed to the Supreme National Security Council. Uh, for those of you who are from the United States, it's uh, sort of a similar body to, to the National Security Council. Uh, it also has some differences, right? It's uh, sort of designed to streamline policy uh, making. It's uh, designed to bring all the different power centers together. And that's actually where the, difference, uh, where the differences with the National Security Council in the United States begin in that in the US, the president is obviously uh, sort of, you know, the, the NSC is under the purview of the president, whereas in Iran, it's uh, sort of the, the, it's the platform that brings together all the power centers. So you have representatives from the Supreme Leader, from uh, the uh, president and his cabinet. Uh, so that's the executive branch, from the legislature, from um, the armed forces, uh, and then depending on the issue for our purposes, potentially uh, even representatives from the uh, Atomic Energy Organization of Iran and other bodies that might be involved in um, sort of the specifics of the issue at hand. And this body has a bit of a feedback loop with all these different power centers, obviously, right? So, um, so the framework is passed on, it's turned into policy there with buy-in from the entire system. And, uh, and here you have this bargaining game that is happening within the system between these different bodies uh, that allows them to ultimately produce this, this policy. We know very little about the actual what happens at the Supreme National Security Council because most of what happens there and uh, what comes out of it is uh, is very limited in the public realm. Uh, most of it is happening in behind closed doors. Uh, so where our sort of knowledge of what happens uh, exactly and, and how it happens is fairly limited. Uh, but again, I think the, the sort of important thing to, to know here is that it is really the body that is uh, responsible for streamlining policy, putting out those policies and then passing it on to all the power centers that are then in charge of executing and implementing uh, Iranian strategy. And that involves, again, the president and his cabinet, which includes the foreign ministry, which includes the Ministry of Intelligence, uh, the defense ministry, uh, but also the armed forces. That's both the uh, conventional Iranian military, the Artish, and also the um, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, as well as other sort of entities like the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, which is in charge of sort of uh, running Iran's nuclear program uh, more broadly. Uh, so these are sort of the main uh, points that I wanted to, to make. And now I want to kind of turn a little bit to why all of this matters and giving you a few examples of where I think this is, um, this is relevant for, for us to know uh, beyond sort of a, you know, academic exercise, right? The first reason that I think this is important, uh, it's important to understand the system and how it works is that... Um, Unlike what is often assumed, Iran's politics matter, but they, as, you know, they tend to be seen as either not mattering at all or being all important. And I think it's somewhere in the middle where they matter and that they draw the contours of policies uh, in the context of bargaining among power centers. But ultimately speaking, uh, once strategic decisions are made, and they're made at the system level uh, through the consensus building, the bar is actually quite high uh, for them to be overturned. And so, again, I think this notion that we have often that you have rogue players within the system that decide to undertake major activities um, to try to poke their adversary, uh, their, their sort of, you know, um, the competing uh, power centers uh, in the eye is kind of misguided uh, because it doesn't capture fully uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, decision making happens. And one example on the nuclear side that I want to kind of um, mention, or actually two examples, is that, you know, once a consensus is made and it's been agreed upon for Iran, for example, to pursue a nuclear weapon, it may be incredibly difficult to overturn that. And I'm not taking a position here on whether Iran is currently trying to pursue a nuclear weapon or not. There's been um, a lot of, happy to come back to it in, in Q&A, I guess. Uh, there's been, um, they're deferring, I guess, um, um, viewpoints, the US intelligence community um, 
at least from the latest sort of reporting that we know has said that, you know, we don't know that the decision has been made to pursue a nuclear weapon. Um, but regardless, if that decision is made again um, at some point, it will be incredibly difficult to roll it back. Similarly, on Iran's enrichment program, which is perhaps the more um, significant one here because it is going, to, it is uh, the topic that is at the center of any nuclear negotiations with Iran. And in fact, the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action spends a lot of time trying to limit Iran's enrichment program. Uh, because we can't, you know, uh, influence really the, the decision to pursue a nuclear weapon or not. But what we can do is try to limit Iran's ability to to uh, to uh, acquire enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon through negotiations. And so enrichment has been the sort of the center, the core of uh, efforts to, to uh, reach a diplomatic solution over Iran's nuclear program. And so you've had, including in the Trump administration today, um, individuals who have pushed for this notion of zero enrichment, uh, which is not a new thing. You know, it was um, pushed also in the 2003 to 2005 timeframe in the first round of nuclear negotiations between Iran and uh, the European, uh, the Europeans, France, Germany, and, and the UK. And it didn't go anywhere, um, which I think may have been surprising to some US decision makers, uh, but that I think is not particularly surprising uh, to anyone who watches Iran uh, because of the fact that you have this consensus around the notion that Iran needs an enrichment program. And you and I may disagree about Iran, whether Iran actually needs an enrichment program. And then, you know, people have debated that extensively, um, uh, but ultimately the perception within the system is that it's needed and that is, an area of consensus. And so for that reason, I would argue that it is incredibly difficult, if not nearly impossible, to get that zero enrichment that Secretary Pompeo has, for example, laid out in his 12 plans, uh, in his 12 uh, points, uh, point plan uh, that he um, he issued about uh, how to limit, how to, you know, sort of bring Iran back into the community of, of normal nations, as he, as he likes to put it. Conversely, though, um, and this is where I think the JCPOA negotiators really got it. Um, there was no consensus about some of the details of the enrichment program. And, the, and because there was no system, at, system level sort of consensus, uh, they were able to get concessions from Iran and to get it to limit uh, extensively parts of its enrichment uh, and their entirety of its uh, enrichment program really. And so if you start from the point that Iran has to forego enrichment, you are unlikely to really get results. But if you accept that, okay, this is a consensus, this is likely not going to change, um, at least via you know, sanctions and diplomacy, then, um, and I would argue even military conflict, fr frankly, it might actually do the opposite, um, then you're able to try to kind of uh, restrict components of it by using the areas of tension or disagreement or the lack of consensus more generally um, within the system. Uh, so, so that's the first point. The second point um, is, uh, and this is sort of very, again, topical, um, both in the US and, and in Europe right now, where uh, as folks are trying to think about what happens next uh, with the uh, future of the um, uh, of the JCPOA, uh, what a potential new president would have to do in order to return to the JCPOA. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the role of the president, and in this case, Rouhani specifically, uh, when it comes to diplomacy. There is this assumption that without Rouhani, right, that if the United States uh, under uh, President Biden, for example, in January, doesn't reach a deal with Rouhani by June when the you know when Iran has elections and Rouhani is unable to run for a third term that's prohibited by the Iranian constitution, then we're not going to see a deal. Um, and um, as my colleague Henry Rome and I recently wrote in a, in a piece, we actually disagree with this because yes, it matters who's president, right? Especially on the working level. And again, here. Anyone who negotiated the nuclear deal can, can tell you that there was a significant difference between how Ahmadinejad, the previous president's team was negotiating and how Rouhani's team was negotiating. One was negotiating in bad faith, the other was negotiating in, in, um, in good faith. One was sort of uh, kicking the can down the road. The other was not trying to kind of just waste time, was actually interested in a, in a negotiated solution. So there are differences in the way things would happen at the working level. But the ultimate sort of 
decision on the strategic level to negotiate or not negotiate is not going to be made merely by the president. And so this notion that if we don't have, if we don't sort of seize this window of opportunity, then it's gone forever and hardliners will come to power and there will be no, no diplomacy, I think is a, a, a sort of a flawed understanding of the Iranian system. And Again, I want to be careful to say that there are good reasons why a quick sort of um, negotiation around the Iranian nuclear program and a quick return to the JCPOA are important. Uh, the fact that Iran's uh, shrinking its breakout time, so the amount of time it would need to build enough to sell material for a nuclear weapon. Um, the fact that um, you, um, you know, the, domestically in the United States, there would be more complications uh, six months later versus uh, immediately in January, uh, just, you know, in terms of uh, relations between the executive branch and, and Congress. So there are reasons to do it. Uh, but one of those reasons is not the Iranian political calendar. Um, and then lastly, um, I guess, and I'll, I'll stop here, Gohar, um, is, you know, in the 2012-2015 timeframe, watching Khamenei's speeches and trying to interpret them became a national sport for non-pro and arms control experts, right? Everybody was watching the Friday prayers, more so than Iranians were, and were trying to decide what, you know, the Supreme Leader meant when he said that, um, you know, the 190,000 swoo comment or, you know, all the comment that he was sort of putting out when uh, including the fact that you know he he insisted that there would be no deal unless sanctions relief came before Iran took any other steps. Um, and so one of the, again, reasons why I wanted to do this and I wanted to kind of dive into some of this decision making uh, was to demystify, I guess, the role of the Supreme Leader a little bit. Sounds like a funny thing to say, I guess, but uh, to, to make sure that there was this understanding that the Supreme Leader is ultimately not necessarily interested in all the details of everything that happens, that his role is not to sort of sit down in his um, in his palace and write down uh, every provision within the JCPOA, right? That's not how it's working. Uh, that he is mostly laying out the groundwork and the baseline and the framework for the negotiations. And so we shouldn't see every single statement, every single detail that comes out of his office as a potential game changer. We should see it in the context of that domestic bargaining that is taking place and sort of take a step back and, and I guess kind of inhale and, you know, um, not freak out every time he's putting out a, a, a comment or a, or a statement. Um, and with this, um, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Arianna. It was extremely informative and, and very, very useful for, for all of us Iran watchers and, and people generally interested in non-proliferation or, you know, people who happen to live on planet Earth. Um, before I, I uh, post some of the questions we received from, uh, from the viewers, I wanted to, to follow up with you on, on this issue of consensus and how hard it is to overturn and tease out some more implications of it specifically for Iran's uh, current actions uh, in, in breaching some of the JCPOA limitations. Do you think what we're seeing right now is, the, is precisely the result of there being an, an internal consensus that JCPOA is worth keeping while also needing to somehow respond and deliver the message that it, this won't last forever. How long do we have, do you think, I mean, not precisely in months, but what will change Iran's, um, what could change Iran's consensus around the, the need to keep the JCPOA? Yeah, that I I think that's exactly right. I I do see the decision, and and I want to just take a step back and again note that this was you know Iran's decision to wait an entire year after President Trump withdrew from the deal, and to continue implementation. And at the time, uh, you know Khamenei had said just a few days after President Trump announced he was withdrawing the U.S. from from the deal, um, that Iran should continue to negotiate with the with the EU. Um, to, to get sanctions relief to see if they could compensate for the U.S. withdrawal, but it should also, quote unquote, start to prepare for uh, the potential collapse of the JCPOA and what would happen next. Uh, and again, there were sort of um, different comments about what that meant, but you know, I think at, the, at its core, uh, it meant exactly what we've seen, right, which was give the Europeans time and see if they can compensate for the U.S. withdrawal. A year later, Iran decided that they did not, uh, while at the same time preparing the groundwork for the resumption of key nuclear activities uh, if they needed to do that, which is what happened. 
And so he had tasked, I guess, the uh, uh, Atomic Energy Organization of Iran and other relevant bodies to start to think about what would make the most sense. And he was not very clear about this, at least in public. But now in hindsight, what we know is that he um, and, and the system wanted calibrated, calculated, mostly reversible steps. Uh, that would allow Iran to signal uh, to the international community, especially Europe, uh, that it had options at its disposal to allow it to gain back some leverage, which it was losing quickly at the time, and to be able to pressure the United States as well, right, so that it wouldn't be the only one receiving the pressure, but it was also able to reciprocate a little bit, uh, and to do it in a way that didn't kill the JCPOA uh, from the get-go, because if they wanted to do that, they could have announced on May uh, the 8th, 2019, when Rouhani made the comments where he announced that Iran was going to be taking several steps, uh, that, you know, they were leaving the deal altogether. But he didn't do that uh, for precisely the reason that they had made a decision. And I think it was a system level decision that the best thing to do would be to wait it out uh, because one, it allowed Iran to sort of gain the upper hand internationally, right, in terms of uh, being now able to point the finger at the United States versus what had been the case previously for two decades where the United States and international community were pointing the finger at Iran. Um, and two, to see if uh, there would be a change in, uh, in sort of the decision making in the United States. And I think that's still the case uh, at least until the end of the, until November, which uh, I realize is just a month. Uh, but um, my personal concern is what happens between November and January, uh, because if, regardless of who wins actually, uh, I think the Iranians will be considering negotiations, right? Uh, whether it happens in the first few months or later on, I think the, the prospect of having to negotiate will be real again. Um, and if they do, then they may want leverage. And uh, so that may be, I mean, the nuclear uh, space is certainly one where they would want to reclaim some of that, that leverage. Uh, but for now, I think that, and especially if uh, Vice President Biden wins, I think that the decision to continue keeping the JCPOA on, I guess, life support uh, would be would be one that would make sense uh, for for until there is uh, sort of, we, we have more knowledge, we have more information about what happens in the new administration. Thank you. We, um, we have a number of questions already submitted to us and I will uh, give priority to questions submitted by our course participants. As I mentioned before, we are in day two of our training for diplomats on nuclear non-proliferation zones. And here we have a question from our participant from Bangladesh, Mr. Tarazul Islam. Um, it ties directly to what you just discussed, and that is what happens to the JCPOA if the US decides to remain outside? Now, so this is not the Biden victory scenario, but should, should President Trump be, be reelected? And the decision there is just to, to continue what they're doing right now, more or less. Would the JCPOA survive that? Uh, and conversely, what is the probability of the new administration after January to, to simply rejoin the JCPOA? Um, so the second one, I guess, an, is an easier one. So it's uh, I'll start with that. Uh, what happens if uh, a new administration decides to to rejoin the JCPOA in, in January? Um, at least from what we know publicly, right? Um, uh, and just from the fact that again, they have decided not to leave the JCPOA, even though they could. And if and uh, that I should also add that the final step that Iran announced, the fifth step that it announced a few months ago, has has been fairly modest, right? It could have been a lot. I mean, I'm not saying that any sort of uh, uh, lifting of restrictions on Iran's nuclear program is a good thing, but it's been a lot more modest than it could have been. Iran could have taken a number of steps that would have been much more problematic from a non-proliferation perspective, uh, including, for example, kicking out um, IAEA inspectors, dialing down its um, uh, adherence to the uh, Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, the additional protocol. So all of those things would could have been um, were options, I guess, and they decided not to take those. Uh, so I, I think there is still a willingness to see if a return to the JCPOA is possible. Um, and I think politically, um, whether it's uh, at the Supreme Leader uh, level or uh, at the presidential level, there is a willingness to do that. Uh, but I should also say that I think that there is not actually a consensus currently on um, whether it makes sense to return to the JCPOA quickly or not within Iran. Uh, because remember that there's a few things going on. First of all, you do have the presidential elections uh, coming up in, in June. 
<clears throat> and so I think that there are parts of the Iranian system that believe that Rouhani would actually regain some of its lost political capital, or he's lost most of his, his political capital, frankly, because of the JCPOA. But I think there are uh, there is a belief that if uh, or he is able to return to the JCPOA, that he would regain some of that. And so there are certainly uh, powerful forces within the system that would like to stop him from, from achieving that. Uh, so that's the first thing to consider. The second thing is that the Supreme Leader is old um, and succession is very much in the back of people's minds. Uh, and so the sort of internal politics that I've been describing, the bargaining, takes a new meaning in that, in, in that context because it means that you know, whoever manages to position themselves well now is also positioning themselves well for succession. And remember that a few years ago, before all this JCPOA drama, Rouhani was one of the sort of candidates, viable candidates, to replace the Supreme Leader. Um, and now we're really not hearing that much about Rouhani as a potential candidate because he has, again, lost all of his political capital. So all these things make it a bit murkier, make it a bit more complicated uh, for a, a potential quick return. Though, again, I, I do think that the, the, the system level decision right now does indicate a, a willingness to at least give it another shot. The second question, or I guess the first question, which was about um, what happens in the event of the United States not returning to the JCPOA come January uh, 2021? Uh, well, I think there's a number of scenarios um, and uh, it's hard to say which one will occur in what sort of order, uh, but I think that we might actually see, I think there's a good chance we'll see a, another round of escalation between the US and Iran um, uh, that will certainly play out on the nuclear side, but also um, sort of in the region, right? Most of the tensions have played out frankly, not in Iran or the United States, but in the broader region. Um, and we'll see more of that uh, because Iran will try to regain leverage um, to the extent that it can. Uh, I think we will either see um, more nuclear actions without Iran necessarily leaving the JCPOA altogether, but also frankly, leaving the JCPOA uh, would be an option. Uh, the Iranians have gone as far as noting that they would even leave the, the, the NPT if there are steps that are taken to further destabilize the, um, the JCPOA CPOA. And uh, I take those with a grain of salt. I think that the, the costs are too high for Iran to leave the NPT altogether. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, um, if things get really bad, maybe that would be a, an option as well. But, and again, on the nuclear side, just for our purposes, I think Iran still has a number of steps that it can take if it decides to further um, limit its participation in the deal, including on the verification and monitoring, which uh, so far it hasn't done because it would really sh uh, rock the boat with uh, the Europeans, uh, especially, right? And again, change the sort of uh, dynamic we have currently of Iran at least being able to say that it's in the right versus the United States. And it would squarely put us back in uh, the sort of pre-2013, pre-2012 uh, space where Iran would be seen as the uh, as sort of the, the one to blame. Uh, and so the Iranians have been careful not to take that route. Uh, but again, if they feel like they have nothing to lose because the maximum pressure campaign is continuing, that that might be an option that they also um, they also undertake. And speaking of, of, of leaving JCPOA and other restrictions and possibly leaving the NPT, we have um, related questions from two course participants. One is from Mufum Domajozi, who is asking, is it possible that Iran has actually taken a decision to return to weapons program? Um, and uh, uh, taking us further from there, a question from Amin al-Hamdani is, how do you see the world and the changes in, in, in the structure of the international system if Iran does acquire nuclear weapons? Yeah, I, I, it's really, really uh, difficult and I want to be very careful not to take a position on, on the question of whether Iran has made the decision to return to a nuclear weapons program because I just don't have that information. Um, again, the, what I can go based off of is what the US intelligence community has assessed and at least from the latest sort of public, um, publicly available information that we have, uh, including under the Trump administration, that decision has not been, been made. Um, though also from what I recall, those um, public available uh, statements uh, and assessments were prior to the Soleimani killing. 
Um, and that is a variable, right? There is, and, and all the tensions that have unfolded since, uh, that and a concern of mine has, has long been that with the maximum pressure campaign, that we would actually be achieving the opposite of what the Trump administration wants to achieve, which is actually pushing Iran toward a nuclear weapon again. Um, and uh, and so you know the killing of uh, Soleimani, who uh, for just um, I think most people know who he is at this point, but uh, in case not, you know one of the top, if not the top, commander in the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, someone who was very close to the Supreme Leader, who was um, sort of a big part of the Iranian uh, political and military um, establishment. So um, uh, who was uh, killed by uh, the United States in Iraq uh, in uh, January? Um, so. Uh, that is that is something to consider. Uh, in terms of how it would change their national system, well, obviously for the worse, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, there there have been decades and decades of scholarship about how proliferation, uh, how the proliferation of nuclear weapons changes international their national system, and whether it stabilizes or destabilizes. I come on the side of I think uh, it would actually destabilize the region, and I think that um, at least from the U.S. and European perspectives, uh, it would make dealing with all of the other issues that they that we have with Iran a lot more difficult. Uh, that means that you know a, a nuclear Iran uh, would be much more difficult to contain in Syria. Uh, it would be much more deter, uh, difficult to deter in Iraq. Uh, and so I think in terms of the region, at least, it it would definitely uh, make the challenges uh, that are currently there uh, a lot worse, and would have uh, implications not just in terms of power competition between different countries, but also in terms of the proxy wars and civil conflicts that are going on where Iran and its adversaries are involved on different sides of the, the conflicts. Thank you. Um, going back to the processes and, and interests that shape the decision-making uh, in Iran and specifically in the Supreme National Security Council, we have several questions that I will try to combine because they, they touch on the different aspects of the same, I think. One is from Jean-Yves Mzana, uh, and he's asking, but what actually is shaping the preferences of different members of this national security, Supreme National Security Council of Iran when it comes to nuclear program? Um, another uh, viewer is asking, sorry, I will have to find the name, but the, the question is, uh, what's shaping uh, the Supreme Leader's decisions on, on red lines? For example, on, on what counters basically to what, what limits to establish, um, broadly speaking. And then Alberto Muti from Vertic is asking, beyond the, the focus on national security as such, what other interests are, are affecting those decisions and preferences like energy security, uh, industrial development, concepts of sovereignty, and, and national identity? Because somebody earlier submitted a question about that has a lot to do with Sort of the continuation of the, the Persian Empire and sort of this kind of self-conception of a nation, how, how that could affect the approach to the nuclear program and negotiations. Yeah, all really important questions. Um, and I think, yeah, actually there are, you're right to group them because uh, I have the same elements of response for, for all of them, right? Um, so the first one to, to touch on uh, briefly is, um, and I think the most important one in the context of the red lines is politics, domestic politics. So if you look at the uh, neat infographic that the Supreme Leader's Office put out <laughs> during the JCPOA talks, um, you know, he laid out, I believe it was seven or eight different red lines. Um, and those red lines were kind of some of them seemed you know like they made sense like enrichment we know that's a red line some of them seemed a bit random like the fact that iran should not close any nuclear facilities uh, even though again ultimately ended up repurposing fordo uh, so that it would not be an enrichment facility it would be a research and development facility so that seemed like a bit of an odd one to throw in there uh, but I think some of that it was actually shaped more so by domestic politics than it was by all the other drivers like national security, like, uh, in part, I think Fordo actually was driven by national security too, since it is buried deep underground and makes it more difficult to strike. Um, but but more so than sovereignty, energy security, and, and some of the, the other um, considerations, it was about domestic politics, because some of these some of the part, different components of the Iranian nuclear program have become so publicized, so politicized, um, so visible to the public uh, that it is very difficult for Iran to, to kind of uh, overturn those things. And so they become red lines, right? Uh, and again, I think enrichment is another good example here where uh, 
part of why enrichment has become such a hot topic and um, you know the number of centrifuges was a big uh, item in the nuclear talks was because the majority of the Iranian public may not necessarily know what enrichment actually is and in fact even if you look at the media commentary and sort of state media often they don't really define enrichment properly or they don't have a very good sense of what it does uh, but because it's become a very public uh, thing that is just something that the the, the population cares about. Uh, it's made it both difficult to make uh, to sort of forego it altogether, and it's given, I would say, in some ways, a good justification to the government not to make uh, not to step back on on those items, right? So I, I think in some ways the propaganda, for example, has worked that Iran needs enrichment, even though I don't know that the majority of people uh, would necessarily know why Iran needs enrichment. Uh, it's not, and and I mean, think of any country, right? Most people and that you would see on the street don't necessarily know why their country may or may not need enrichment. Enrichment. It's not something that is uh, a very concrete sort of uh, issue, bread and butter issue for people. Uh, so it's the same thing in Iran, but the government has been able to really capitalize on on the, the sort of national sentiment, nationalistic sentiment, and, and to sell uh, components of the Iranian nuclear program to the public as really key to the national identity. So that goes to Alberto's uh, question about, you know, what are some of the other drivers? Uh, nationalism is definitely one, right? It's not surprising that, uh, actually, I was teaching last night this, uh, the, the topic of nationalism and, and nuclear politics in Iran. And um, I played this sort of rap video from a few years ago, from 2015. Uh, where an Iranian rapper uh, who's uh, fairly well known uh, was sort of, uh, you know, singing the song about why his country needs a nuclear program and why, you know, nanotechnology and, and all that stuff. So, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's not very often that you see this in, in other countries. And again, this is part of the sort of PR machine. Uh, it's not surprising that um, you see uh, propaganda photos, for example, of the Iranian Jewish community um, holding uh, sort of, you know, um, cards saying in English, Hebrew and Persian that their country needs nuclear power, right? It's not very often that the Jewish community in Iran is asked to bring out cards saying uh, things uh, that in support of policy. So this is one of those instances where uh, really there is a uh, there's both a there's a top down effort uh, to make it into a nationalistic issue, and I think that again it's worked to some extent. Um, to the point where even people who don't really like the regime um, and who don't really understand what the nuclear program does think that it is something they need. Um, the other element is the element of prestige, and this touches on the whole notion of, you know, Persian identity, I guess, or Iranian identity to be more inclusive. Um, uh, which is that, you know, the the government often frames it and Khamenei does it very often in terms of progress and self-reliance and sovereignty. So the nuclear program is not framed as just, you know, a sort of a, a technical issue. It's uh, framed as, you know, this is key to the nation being in the small club of nations that has access to this technology. It is the difference between Iran being in the 21st century, which is a sort of an outdated view of the nuclear of nuclear technology, but it's certainly a view that continues to persist within, within Iran, uh, that absent uh, this this program, they would not be in the sort of uh, League of Nations who have made it essentially, if you, if you want, uh, if you will. Uh, so these are all small sort of um, uh, drivers, I think, that we can also point to. But of course, there is things like their national system, the the U the state of U.S. Iran competition, uh, or I shouldn't say competition; it's not really a competition. I should say uh, the relationship between the two sides and the regional dynamics. All of those things have been uh, big drivers behind Iran's nuclear program and the decisions behind the nature of the program. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to group um, several questions again because um, uh, some of them, a lot of them, have the same the same theme to it. Uh, so uh, one of our course participants uh, from, from the Netherlands, Henry Philippens, uh, kicks the ball with um, bringing in other actors, not just Europe and US, but the importance of the surrounding area, so to say, um, to Iran's nuclear decision making and approach to the JCPOA. And some of the uh, viewers also uh, are bringing in the recent rapprochement between parts of the Arab world and Israel and how that might affect Iran's 
Iran's behavior and Iran's uh, outlook on the JCPOA and, and, and nuclear activities. Um, how does that factor into Iranian decision making on the issues? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of flows directly from what I was saying before about the, the regional dynamics, right? Um, it is for the past sort of essentially 40 years, um, I mean, Iran has often been isolated in its region, especially since the revolution. Um, but I think the isolation has taken a new level and to, with all the caveats that pertain to the recent announcements uh, that we don't have all the details of what is actually what it actually entails yet and, and so on and so forth. But um, it certainly uh, does look like Iran is much more isolated now that you have this sort of rapprochement between uh, Israel on the one hand and a uh, number of key Arab states on the other, including the UAE, which until recently Iran was um, had re-engaged with uh, uh, in the aftermath of the 2019 uh, escalation in the Gulf. So with uh, now this rapprochement taking place, I think the sense of isolation, which has, I should also pause to say, has been a really significant driver um, and uh, in, in shaping the Iranian psyche um, for centuries actually, uh, is, is going to be triggered quite a bit. Um, I, I think that uh, that is certainly, you know, Iran will use it rhetorically to claim uh, the leadership of the resistance um, and, and so on. But I think in reality, there is a sense that Iran is increasingly isolated and not just internationally, but in its immediate region as well. And, and, and so, yes, that, I think that that is likely to, to sort of shape the way Iran thinks about its nuclear program. And that may not just be on whether or not to weaponize, right? It may very well be on whether or not to negotiate and how to negotiate on whether to build on the JCPOA as uh, Vice President Biden has um, laid out in his, um, in his sort of platform, the Democrats have laid out in their platform. Uh, which is that, um, you know, they might actually decide that it makes sense to uh, take steps toward addressing some of those broader problems that have continued to isolate Iran, regardless of the solution on the nuclear program, uh, and to talk about regional conflicts in order to kind of be able to at least resume more normalized relations with, with Europe. Um, I mean, that's just one scenario. It's not, uh, I'm not suggesting that this is exactly what's going to happen, uh, but I'm trying to, to indicate that, yes, it is something that the Iranians are definitely thinking about, uh, but it can actually lead them to go a number of different ways. Um, again, some questions from our course participants, but also grouping them with, with others. And this is a sort of a, degrees of, of, of leaving the commitments. And, and the question from a course participant, uh, uh, Elis Lakhal, is what additional costs would Iran bear in case it leaves the NPT? So that's kind of the, the drastic step. Um, I, whereas uh, Pantelis Economo is asking what if Iran stops a, an additional pro protocol implementation, but does stay in the NPT, sort of goes to status quo ante in, in, in terms of comprehensive safeguards. Is that, is that something that, I guess it's more a question of what, what kinds of costs would be imposed on Iran um, and, and how are these US decision making makers approaching it? So I think, um, yeah, the, the, the two, I guess, more uh, extreme things that can happen are the most extreme being Iran leaves the NPT, right? Um, and uh, sort of follows the North Korea path, I guess. Um, and I think there, um, there are different costs that are obviously, you know, um, that are possible. And I think that from Iran's perspective too, there are different things that can happen. Um, and the reason why I think they haven't done it yet is because none of those scenarios are particularly good for Iran. Um, so one being that you actually do end up seeing Israeli or US um, strikes on Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, that is not outside the realm of possibilities. Uh, we just this over the summer, um, there were um, you know explosions at, at Natanz um, that may or may not be linked to Israel. Uh, so um, I, I and you know there have been various points in time over the past decade, decade and a half, uh, where the Israelis were pretty close to striking Iranian nuclear facilities. And so, and especially if we have a second Trump presidency, I, I don't see the United States, you know, kind of opposing that, right? Uh, 
Um, and, and so I, I think that that is very much a real possibility, which partially explains why they've continued to keep Fordo, uh, what they've, why they've insisted on keeping Fordo. Uh, but it also, I think, explains uh, what, one of the, the sort of reason why Iran hasn't chosen to leave the NPT. Uh, the second thing that can happen, um, I guess, and again, these are not the, this is not uh, the most comprehensive list of it, but just a few things to, to consider, uh, is that um, you do have have more of a international pressure. So again, currently you have this division between the United States on the one hand and Europe on the other, but also Russia and China and the rest of their national community with the arms embargo drama at the UN Security Council recently, we saw just how isolated the United States is um, with the Dominican Republic being the only country out of uh, 15 to side with the United States. Um, whether Iran leaves the NPT or uh, sort of decides to stop implementing the AP, I think that will change that dynamic where, and especially if it leaves the NPT, where you actually end up, the United States end up regaining um, support among uh, the UN Security Council, among key European allies, and I would say even uh, perhaps Russia and China, neither of which are particularly inclined to side with the United States on the issue of the JCPOA, but they're also not inclined um, to toward a, another nuclear armed state. And so I, I think that the international pressure uh, would, be, would be pretty significant. And with that would come all the things like sanctions um, that, would be, that would hurt Iran's economy even more because now you would have a multilateral effort uh, as well as the current unilateral one that the United States has been pursuing. Um, and, and, you know, and just sort of to briefly pause on this, um, Iran has been watching North Korea for decades, right? It's, uh, and there have been debates within Iran about whether or not the North Korean model is one that makes sense. Um, and I, I think there is a general sort of agreement that yes, they have nuclear weapons, but also does Iran really want to become North Korea? Uh, deeply isolated, um, a, a country that, you know, and Iran is, uh, as a, as a, in general, as a population, Iranians are fairly outward looking. They have, one of their key problems with their current government and leaders has been that they've been isolated for, for 40 years. So this would not uh, make it easier for either the public or the leaders uh, to, um, uh, to reintegrate Iran into their national community. Uh, and then lastly, I would say on the AP side specifically, I think then we would see more of a move toward using the dispute resolution mechanism um, within the JCPOA by the Europeans. They've been very reluctant to take any action that would further de derail the JCPOA because um, they're hoping that you know, um, the US will return to the JCPOA at some point. Uh, but I think if uh, Iran really goes after the monitoring and verification, which is really key, I think, from both a non-proliferation perspective and from sort of an EU uh, interest perspective, uh, that uh, we will see more of a, uh, a, a sort of a forceful way of dealing with uh, Iran's nuclear, uh, with Iran's uh, um, limit uh, violations, I guess, of the JCPOA. Thank you. Um, we have some questions that I think are would follow up nicely on some of the issues you, you touched in, in the last ans answer in particular. Um, uh, one of our course participants, uh, Mahmoud Hamdi, is asking about the how do you see the effect of the US uh, snapback or sanctions or attempted snapback of sanctions, as it were, on Iran's decision making process. And on the flip side, there's another, another viewer asking, um, how does US current isolation you know, on the UN Security Council affect the prospects for, um, for getting the US back in the, in the, into the JCPOA or negotiating um, a new deal. Um, and to pick up on your mention of Russia and China, Jean-Maurice Coté is asking, what is actually the role of Russia in China in, in, in shaping Iran's, prefer Iran's preferences and, and decisions? Um, let me start with the Russia and China question um, because it is an it's an interesting one. Um, Happens to be the theme of your book. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, and actually, last time you know you you had me over was with Dina for the purposes of discussing this book. So all of this will sound familiar to 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 your participants who were there. Um, so Russia and China are complicated relationships for Iran, um, which means that they also have kind of an interesting way of affecting Iranian decision-making, right? They're both um, two of the top partners that Iran has currently. Um, it's very heavily, Iran is very heavily reliant on Russia for its nuclear program, Russia for the entirety of the Islamic uh, 
uh, Republic, so 40 plus years, has been the main and at times only supplier for Iran's nuclear program. So without Russia, uh, Iran wouldn't be really able to run its uh, main nuclear power plant right now, right? So, you know, it's, it is a very uh, kind of an important country when it comes to the nuclear program specifically, but defense more generally too. Iran is reliant on, on Russia for defense systems. And um, that's part of the concern that pushed the administration to uh, to engage in the whole um, sort of uh, arms embargo uh, push and pull, I guess. Uh, let's, let's put it this way. Um, and China has been key to Iran's economic, um, it's a, uh, Iran's ability to kind of sustain itself economically. Uh, China has become a really important player in key sectors of the Iranian economy, ranging from energy to telecommunications to uh, infrastructure. And, you know, there is this new uh, Iran-China 25-year uh, deal that was announced recently um, that sort of cements uh, that is trying to cement all of this and, you know, again, to be taken with grains of salt, happy to come back to it. Um, but uh, but there's it's a complicated relationship because Iran doesn't really trust either of those countries. And one of the reasons why Iran returned to the negotiating table in 2012 uh, to begin with uh, was because it was trying to decrease its reliance on both Russia and China. And throughout the previous decade, as international sanctions had kicked in, the Russians and the Chinese not being very eager to impose sanctions, they ultimately did follow suit, but they were not very eager to. Um, they both became really uh, the only countries that Iran was reliant on, and um, and Iranians really resent, resented that, that idea. Um, because all of the sort of historical distrust was with Russia because of the fact that the Chinese were not quick to deliver on the projects they were promising. And so uh, the Iranians really wanted to turn uh, to have options for suppliers, for partners uh, with Europe specifically. They never saw the United States as a real option because of uh, the sort of deep um, issues going back to you know decades, frankly, um, and the fact that it's just not a viable political um, uh, goal to have in either Washington or in Tehran uh, to, to normalize relations. Um, but with the Europeans, it was different. So, the, the Iran has been trying to kind of decrease its reliance on, on both of those countries and has inevitably been uh, had to go back to them um, as the isolation has continued. Uh, but that means that the Russians and the Chinese have a significant amount of leverage on, on Iran, uh, but because of this deep distrust and, and because of all the limitations that exist, you know, these are not alliances, they're partnerships. They're not, the Russians and the Chinese will never pick Iran over their other interests and Iran knows that. So for all these reasons, um, the the there is leverage, but it's not, you know, it's it's uh, it, there are limitations to it, and so I, I think that the Iranians, when they make their calculations, they certainly have Russia and China on the back burner as options to to turn to, but they never make plans around Russia and China uh, because they know that ultimately they can't uh, they can't do that. That if the Chinese were to get a trade deal with the United States, that Iran would be the first um, sort of under the bus, right? That it wouldn't uh, sort of be able to compete with the US in terms of how the Chinese view their, um, their trade and political uh, and security, frankly, interests. Um, so uh, that's the Russia-China uh, question. Um, the, I'm trying to remember, oh, the- The role of snapback or attempted snapback and the, possible impact of current US isolation on any attempt to negotiate a new deal. So if I remember correctly, the second question was about how it shapes the US side. And um, frankly, it doesn't seem like it is, right? Um, I. Uh, it, the, the administration, you know, for, for months and months prior to this, to the snapback and arms embargo um, issue, uh, there were warnings that the United States would be isolated. Uh, there were warnings within the United States. There were warnings from European allies. It was clear that the United States was at best going to have a couple of votes that didn't even get that, uh, but that didn't stop it. Um, and it's clear that the Trump administration's view of alliances, of multilateralism, um, is uh, is sort of um, is different from how traditionally I, I think both Republicans and Democrats have have thought about the issue. Um, and uh, that the administration doesn't really care, frankly, what the allies and, and partners think. And, you know, that is likely to hold true for a second 
uh, if Trump is reelected. I, I don't think that he will be making decisions based on what the allies and partners want. I think he'll be making decisions based on what makes politically sense for uh, for him. I think that is the main frame through which he sees um, international affairs, um, in including non-proliferation and arms control, right? It's more about the internal political uh, issues than it is about um, the, frankly, I would say even national security, but that's a, that's a different story. Uh, and then the issue of snapback, um, again, uh, you know, I think it's clear at this point that the United States is completely isolated on, on this issue, that it's not really having the effect that the administration had hoped. What remains to be seen is what happens in January 2021. Um, a President Biden, for example, could roll that back uh, and say, listen, snapback didn't happen. We're going to sort of resume. Uh, and, you know, again, this is what um, he said in, in his uh, sort of platform is a um, kind of a compliance for compliance, right? If the United States will return to the deal, if Iran resumes compliance uh, with its obligations. Uh, and in that context, the snapback situation would uh, kind of, along with the other steps that, are, that the U.S. has taken uh, would be rolled back. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, that, that is something that uh, remains to be seen uh, what happens in, in January. What about Iran's uh, view of the snapback and, and was, was the current isolation, the very public display of U.S. isolation reassuring in a way to, to Iranian um, leadership in terms of you know, reliability of, of European partners and, and their commitment to, to the JCPOA? Um, yes, but at the end of the day, it doesn't put money or it doesn't put food on the table, right? Um, and I think that is something that you've heard a lot um, over the past uh, three, two years, I guess, uh, two years uh, since the US left the JCPOA, the Iranians will say, well, you know, it's great that Europe is talking the talk, but it's not walking the walk. And you know, it's a separate conversation how much Europe can actually do by itself. And I won't get into that because I'm not a sanctions expert. So I'll leave that to people who know more about sanctions than I do. Uh, but uh, from certainly from Iran's perspective, uh, what you've seen is uh, the Europeans uh, being very good at siding with the JCPOA, reiterating commitments, you know, telling the, the administration that it was uh, in the wrong. Uh, but none of that has changed uh, the inflation and uh, the fact that Iran is unable to get access to, you know, um, the banking system. And uh, frankly, with COVID humanitarian uh, sort of transactions and, and uh, treatment and uh, cancer treatment and, you know, um, medical devices and so on. So none of that is actually changing the practical uh, side of things, which is uh, partly why I think the Iranians have also ultimately in, in May decided to, to May 28, 2019, decided to start taking these steps because yes, the Europeans were very eager and very vocal to support the JCPOA, but the Iranians were not really seeing uh, the practical uh, kind of implications of that. Um, there's a follow-on question and I think, I think you mostly addressed this and that is if the US return, offered to return to the JCPOA sort of as, as negotiated, in return for Iranian return to compliance, would that would that be agreeable to Iran? That, I, I want to say that's kind of an ideal case scenario for for Iran, probably not for the United States. But would would the Biden administration attempt that, and should it really? And tie it to the return to the extension of the agreement. So the the proverbial question of the time limitations that expire. So again, what we know from the from the vice president's thinking is uh, to return to the JCPOA and then work to build on it, right? And again, it's it would be a compliance for compliance thing. Uh, I think the the main sort of consideration there would is is um, that right now Iran is shrinking the breakout time, and um, and so for a new administration to come in, essentially finding itself in the place that the Obama administration found itself. Uh, would be concerning. And so the first order of business would be to uh, make sure that, you know, you have a return to uh, to Iran implementing the JCPOA fully and uh, exp 
ex sort of buying time, right? Uh, ultimately, that's what it's about: buying time and then working to address the other uh, the other issues. There are different schools of thought um, in the United States about whether that makes the most sense or not. You know, there are people who would argue. I think on on different sides, actually, I don't think there's a bit of I don't think there's a consensus on on either side of the aisle on this about whether um, you know, the United States has leverage and therefore should be using that leverage uh, to actually extend and expand the JCPOA immediately. Um, and um, you know, there, again, you have different schools of thought about what extending and expanding means. Uh, so you could start with sort of the sunsets, right? The, 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 the time limits that exist on different components of the JCPOA. Uh, but you know, expanding could also mean um, dealing with Iran's ballistic missile program, which is a much more challenging uh, issue Issue, uh, or even regional activities, which again would be a much more complex issue. And I should add that it's not clear that the format that currently exists for the JCPOA, so the B5 plus one format, would actually make sense for these other things, right? It might to some extent for the ballistic missile situation. Um, but in my mind, uh, having the regional track happen with the P5 plus one makes zero sense. Um, the Certainly members of the P5 plus one, including the United States would play a role, uh, but the regional situation should happen within the region or else it's not going to be sustainable. And if last time, regional partners were unhappy about uh, how much they were kept in the loop on the nuclear issue. Imagine uh, how upset they would be if uh, the United States sat down across the room from Iran and uh, with the rest of the P5 plus one and decided the fate of Yemen and Syria and, and so on. It, it just, it's not a very sustainable way to do that. So again, I think there are a number of uh, sort of broader and issues that need to be addressed in order to think about the expansion, what it means, how it should be done, on what timeline. I don't think it's realistic uh, to think uh, that you can, within you know a few months of a new president taking office, that you can return to the JCPOA with all of the things that that entails, including you know sanctions relief, which not not very uh, you know easy, and uh, it's not a you will need a few months for that. Uh, include and and then uh, work to expand the sunsets, extend the sunsets, and then work to include ballistic missiles and regional activities and so on. I, I don't think that's a uh, it's reasonable to, to ask for that to happen all within a few months of a new administration taking office. And we shouldn't, frankly. I don't think you would get a sustainable and good deal um, on such complex matters within just a few uh, within just a few months. Thank you. We're nearing our, our time, but to pick up on something you, you mentioned, and there is a question um, in the Q&A about it. Um, you mentioned the region and, and some of the issues that have to be addressed by the region within the region. And there's a question, um, what are kind of confidence building measures that um, the Arab states and Iran could discuss uh, specifically actually within the context of the process that started in the UN General Assembly towards the Middle East zone free of weapons of mass destruction? Is that a potential avenue to address some of the issues that don't fit into the, the JCPOA kind of file? Mogar, you're the expert on <laughs> nuclear weapon free zones, so <laughs> I don't know that I have a, a, a very uh, a very good answer there. I think there are a number of things that the two sides can do. I mean, the, uh, certainly on the nuclear uh, side of things, uh, you know, for a while there's been discussions about nuclear safety uh, and security, which are not the sort of um, they don't get the same attention as enrichment and and so on, right? Um, as the sort of more um, uh, more visible topics, but those are issues that that matter for the entire region. Uh, and you know, the JCPOA provided for some cooperation on those items. Again, they don't get as much attention as the sort of enrichment-specific um, topics, for example. Uh, but those are issues that that the entirety of the the region, as countries develop their nuclear programs, can and should care about. Um, and do care about. So um, I, I would start by saying that Iran is, uh, you know, compared to the UAE, for example, certainly is uh, is a delinquent on a lot of these uh, items. Uh, so you know, you could have a confidence building that starts there. Uh, but I think you also need broader engagement within the region. And I think that you know, for a while, when the UAE and Iran were starting on this track of maritime security, I thought that was a positive thing. And I hope that it doesn't end with this sort of uh, Israel UAE 
rapprochement because it is something that is, again, going to be um, critical uh, for all sides of the Gulf, frankly, um, regardless of, uh, of what president is in, is in office and regardless of the status of uh, Iran's nuclear program. So I think, you know, there are nuclear specific things that can be done, but there are broader uh, stuff, there's pro broader uh, issues uh, that the two sides, that all sides should really be considering as well uh, to, to kind of, you know, to, yeah, uh, to, to have confidence building uh, and, and to uh, have a region that that is not on the brink of uh, sort of a broader confrontation every time the United States and Iran um, butt heads uh, a little bit that so that you know the UAE and and, and other countries don't end up being dragged into uh, the sort of escalation as we saw in 2019 um, when the US and Iran um, uh, end up in their own tensions. Thank you. Um, we are, we're nearing the, the time limit for our webinar. Um, and I just wanna say it, uh, to those who submitted questions who and, and the questions did not get posed specifically, um, it wasn't possible for me to fit them all, but also um, Ariane already answered some of them <laughs> in, in, in her responses to other questions. Um, and for that, I really thank you, Ariane. And, and I would like to give you the floor again for any kind of concluding remarks, something you want us, you want to leave us with with regard to Iran's nuclear program and, and decision-making, something that, that you think is um, important and, and was not necessarily raised in the Q&A session? Um, well, this is the most difficult question you've asked so far. <laughs> um, Look, I mean, the, the one thing that I, I hope uh, folks take away from, from this, uh, that's been my personal hobby horse um, over the years is to really try to take a more cool headed approach to uh, Iranian politics. I, I think there's a tendency to kind of jump to conclusions to, um, to overestimate or underestimate uh, pol politics. And frankly, right now uh, to overestimate our ability to influence domestic politics within Iran. So much of the commentary I'm seeing is sort of noting that, uh, you know, if uh, if we do, if the United States does X on the nuclear program, then uh, moderates will be empowered or hardliners won't be empowered. And I think that the history, if you look at the patterns uh, in the politics of, of Iran, um, that's not that's not necessarily uh, the case. And uh, I, I think that ultimately what should be driving any future engagement on Iran's nuclear program is non-proliferation considerations rather than um, the US, Europe trying to game out Iran's, nuclear, Iran's politics um, because that's not something that, you know, frankly, uh, the United States is particularly good at as uh, history has shown. Uh, and it's not what should be driving the, uh, the, the negotiation. So that's the sort of final thing that I would, uh, that I would leave you with. Thank you very much, Ariane. Those are indeed very important points. And, and I hope you, you are heard uh, both in Europe and more importantly in the United States uh, on, on this subject. And this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and let's do that again sometime. But in the meantime, uh, uh, I would like to also thank all of our viewers and course participants for engaging interesting questions. And if you want to continue with the topic, follow Ariane on Twitter or follow her numerous publications. Uh, you're guaranteed to read something at least once a week, but probably more, more often. Um, and, uh, and if you want to learn more about this issue and, and others, tune in to other VCDNP webinars. We're also uh, trying to host them regularly and, and, and address uh, all, all kinds of aspects of nuclear weapons and non-proliferation problem. With that, again, thank you so very much and everyone enjoy your day, your afternoon or your evening, depending on uh, where you are. Thank you.